All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, what is it, Thursday? All right. So we have. We finished chapter seven today. All right. Um, so we finished off with kind of introducing this idea of empirical formula, right? Um, where we use this kind of molar relationship thing, the same kind of thing approach we took with stoichiometry, only now it's just applied to like figuring out a particular um, empirical formula or percent composition where you're just looking at molar ratios. So you think of it like that, this whole chapter is really based on the idea of molar ratios. Um, so because an empirical formula is simply a reduced ratio of the molecular formula, if you have the molecular mass, which is something you can get sometimes through like mass spectrometry, of course, mass spectrometry, you can usually get the structure too. But anyway, sometimes you can get a molecular mass um, and you have an empirical formula. If you get the empirical mass, divide the molecular mass, divided by the empirical mass, there should be a whole number ratio relationship, right? I mean, you can just think about it like this. Let's just take something simple. Let's say this is our empirical formula, right? And this is our molecular formula. Then you could certainly see that the, the mass of this will be twice the mass of this, right? So if you figure out the empirical formula and you're given the molecular mass, you can get the molecular formula. Because what you'll do is you'll just take the one mass of this, divide it by this, and you'll get just a whole number mole ratio. In this case, you'll get two, which means you would know if this was your empirical formula, you would just multiply each of these by two to get your molecular formula. All right? Does that make sense? Questions? All right. So what we're gonna do is look at, didn't we do this one already? Oh, we did this one already, didn't we? So what, I don't remember talking about this though. Maybe I kind of skipped the slide, I don't know. Anyway, if I did talk about it, I've reiterated it. <laughs> and we did this one, this is the one that was CU2S, right? Yeah, we did this yesterday. All right, now oh, there it is. So remember it's percent to mass, mass to moles, divide by smallest, multiply to a whole. So let's do another one, let's do asbestos. Asbestos is kind of still in the news, not quite as much as it was, you know, five years ago, but um, it's insulating material in buildings and things like that. And when it kind of flakes, it creates some fibers that get trapped in your lung and cause lung cancer. This is a known carcinogen. Well, there's lots of of uh, suspected carcinogens out there, probable carcinogens, depending on which group you're talking about. If it's like the Toxicology Society or um, um, who's the other group that puts together uh, um, carcinogen lists. Anyway, I can't remember. You'll see different, different ones and different lists, but this is one of these ones that everyone recognizes. We have enough data on to know this is a carcinogen. Um, it's fine when it's in place, it's when it starts to get ripped out, it's worse than when it starts to flake. Um, but it's a mineral, it's a natural mineral component material, and then they just take it, mine it, and create it into like, you know, uh, sheets that can be used as, as insulation. And it contains magnesium, silicon, oxygen, and hydrogen. One form of, of asbestos, chrysotile, given a molecular mass there for you, has the composition of 28.03% magnesium, 21.6% silicon, 1.16% hydrogen. What's missing? Oxygen, right? But we can figure that out, right? Because the total has to be 100%. So we know oxygen's whatever wasn't told to us because it says it's got magnesium, silicon, oxygen, and hydrogen, and we're given 
uh, magnesium, silicon, and hydrogen so we can figure out oxygen. So we're given the percentages. So all we're going to do is take these four percentages, convert them to mass by assuming 100 gram sample, percent to mass, take the molar masses from the periodic table, mass to moles. Then we'll take the smallest number, divide all of them by the smallest. And then if we need to, we'll multiply until we get whole numbers. This is way too long for an exam question. Exam question would more likely or not be just be two elements, maybe three, two elements. This has got four elements in it, it's a lot of work. But if you can do something like this, then you're definitely ready for an exam. So this is what we were given in percentages. I just immediately converted it to mass. And we're going to do each of these. Okay. And then we'll subtract. So I have your calculators out because I don't have them worked out. I have the final answer, but I don't have the, the math worked out. So I simply said, okay, I'm taking 100 gram sample. So my percents go to masses. I'm going to do mass to moles now. So magnesium, remember, taking up significant figures. I told you this. It's important. 24.305. That gives me five sig figs, so that's good. Percent to mass, mass to moles. Someone can do that. Someone else can do silicon. We will use 28.086. And of course, hydrogen is 1.01, 1 .01, or actually 1.0079. And I need someone also to figure out the oxygen percent. So we need 100 minus 28.03, minus 21.6, and minus 1.16 to tell me what oxygen is. So if you do one of these, uh, raise your hand and tell me what it is, and I'll write it down. Which one you got, Abigail? What is it? Okay, so we'll say 49.21 grams times one mole is right around 16, but let's say it's going to be 16.000, I think. Yeah, 16.000 grams in one mole. So we need all four of these numbers now. And that's moles, right? Yes. What's the one point? Thank you. One more. <laughs> For oxygen, I got three point zero seven six or three point seven five six So that's that's fine because we've got. One, oh, that's only four six figs. Yeah, that's all we need is four six figs because we get four or one. That's fine. That one has five, doesn't matter. Some have five six figs, some have four, but you want at least four because they all have four six figs to start. Okay, now that's percent to mass, mass to moles, divide by smallest. So we're going to divide them all by the silicon, right? I need someone to do this, these math. Obviously, I can do that one myself. <laughs> Whoops, six, nine, one.
four, like four point zero zero. Three point nine nine eight seven nine. Okay, we got exactly four for oxygen. <laughs> nice and close to 1.5. Four, nine, six, four. Nice and close to 1.5. Okay, so it looks like if you multiply them all by two of well, whole numbers, right? Because you got one and a half, one, one and a half, and four. Whatever we do to one, we have to do it all then, but one and a half times two is gonna give me three. So I'm gonna multiply them, by them all by two. So I get three, two, three, and eight. If we did it right, see so what I had here, MG3SI2H3O8, very good. Now you can see we can simply divide the, the molecular mass which we were given, make room for this, it's kind of, Take this, which was given, and divide it by this. This is basically the mass of this right here. So if you add that all up, you will get the 260. 0 0.1107, so that's three times the magnesium, two times the silicon's mass, three times hydrogen, eight times oxygen, you get about 260, okay? That is the empirical mass of the formula we just figured out. We were given the molecular mass, which should be a whole number ratio, and it is exactly divide those two by two. Then you know your molecular form is two times each of those. So it's magnesium six, silicon four, hydrogen six, oxygen 16. Question. Again, way too long for a exam question, but you can do this and you know how to do it. You get comfortable with these, then you get one on an exam that's only got two or three at most. And I usually make it so that sometimes the numbers are quick and easy to, to do, you know? Yes. The two? What do you mean the two? Two is the, the, the whole number multiple. So you're taking the, the molecular mass, dividing it by the empirical mass, and you get a whole number multiple. It's just like this right here. These right here, I said, this is the empirical formula. This is the molecular formula. Obviously, this is going to be twice the mass of that. You've got two carbons, right? You can see that. It's nice and easy. It's going to be divide this mass by that mass, and you'll get a whole number of two. And then... You don't know this formula, you just know the mass, right? See what I'm saying? That's what we just determined. You don't know this, you're just given the mass. Take the mass of this, you don't know what it is, divide it by the mass of this, you get two, and then you multiply this by two to get your empirical formula. That's what we did. Does that make sense, Mary? Yes, what's your first name? Ilana. Ilana, that's right. Um, I was just wondering, is the order in which the elements is important? Because there were some smart work questions that I got wrong because I didn't put it into the What was the question? Because something like this, I mean. Something like this, the order is not that. Usually the metals are listed first to non-metals on the right, similar to the way you would do an ionic compound like lithium. Um, lithium sulfide, something like that. The metal comes first. Um, what was the question where they, do you remember? I don't know. I mean, I figured it out because 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some of them are, are kind of just convention. I mean, because this really is a mineral. So the order is really irrelevant. That, that doesn't tell you anything about it. It's not a structural formula. Um, it's a mineral with a crystalline structure. So kind of just a list, but the usual convention is metal to non-metal. But yeah, I mean, you could have had the oxygen before the hydrogen here. It really doesn't make a difference. No one, no one, you know, there's no convention there. Sometimes if you know the structure of the mineral, they put them in certain orders to make it clear, but I, I don't know the structure of this mineral off the top of my head. Other questions? All right. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit. It's still empirical formula, but we're looking at, um, well, it's really a molecular formula because it's not a, there's gonna be no metals in this. Um, we're looking at, you know, another type of analysis called combustion analysis. And this works great for these carbon compounds. And you can even do ones with oxygen in them. Okay, and the reason is when we do a combustion, the only byproducts are CO2 and water, right? So even if you throw an oxygen in there, so if you combust a fuel like a, a gasoline, right, which is all carbon and hydrogen, your only byproducts are CO2 and water. If you combust like a sugar, like glucose, something like that has oxygen in it, you're still, your only byproducts will be, your only products will be CO2 and water. So you can add an oxygen in here, and we can apply this to a, now a whole host of compounds. And this is useful because you can do a combustion analysis, collect your CO2 and your water, analyze the mass of those, and know that all the hydrogen that's in this water right here had to come from here. And all the carbon in this CO2 had to come from here. Right? That's the only source in a combustion reaction. There's not a huge amount of carbon and, and, and hydrogen in the air, okay? But if you're dealing with a compound with oxygen, that gets a little tricky because the source of oxygen now is both this and in the combustion, we got to add oxygen, right, from the air. So now you don't know where the oxygen's that's in here. Some of it came from the air, but some of it came from your original compound. You see? You understand what I'm saying? So we got to do a little, little tricky math there to figure out what, which of that, where, where the, which oxygen came from the actual compound. And there's a way to do that. So we're basically going to do a combustion analysis. Now, this is a straight hydrocarbon. There's no oxygen. Combustion analysis of a hydrocarbon yields 1.32 grams of CO2 and 0.541 grams of water. What's the empirical form of the hydrocarbon? You're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna do kind of mass to moles, right? You're just gonna go back to the initial carbon. Look what we've done. We take the CO2, we convert it to moles, and we say there's one mole of carbon for every one mole of CO2. That's like using percent composition, right? This molar relationship. And that tells us the moles of carbon, okay? And we do the same thing with water. Only difference is there are two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of water. That's just coming from the formula. There's two hydrogen for every one water. You'll do something like this. Well, we used to do something like this in lab. I don't know if you're still doing it. The lab's changed a lot in the last year. There's a new coordinator. Now, what you can see is there's twice as much you don't even have to do. Normally, we would do divide by smallest, multiply to whole, right? Well, we can kind of skip that. We can see this is twice as much as that, right? You're going to get one and two. And you can do it if you want. 0.03 divided by 0.03 gets you one, and 0.06 divided by 0.03 gets you two. So we know those are two to one relationships. So our empirical formula is CH2. So we're able to get a empirical formula 
of the compound simply by burning it and collecting the CO2 and water. And that's pretty powerful, pretty useful analysis. Simply burn it, collect the, and this is easy enough to do, to collect have CO2 absorbers and water absorbers. Easy enough to do, analyze the mass. Simply, you don't need special, you know, you gotta have the chambers here, but you don't need expensive equipment for analysis. This is a fairly simple system compared to having elaborate instruments that can tell you molecular ions. Of course, we would need the molecular mass if we wanted to know the molecular formula. And that's what we just did with the specimens. Okay, we were given the, the mass and we were able to calculate the actual formula. But we don't have that here. So you just stop at the empirical formula. But we're gonna do an example now to finish up before we do the review, where we're gonna take one all the way through combustion analysis of a compound. We're gonna do one with oxygen. Because if you can do a problem like this, then you can do anything that's on the exam. Okay, I do that often sometimes where I do actually tougher problems in class. And I assign you some tough ones on in the back of the book, in the back of the chapter, I should say, too, that are often tougher than what you might see. Some of them are easier, some are tougher, and some are about what you'll see. That's why I say if you do, can do all the work, you're ready for the exam. Okay, vitamin C. It's one of those vitamins a lot of people take. I occasionally take vitamin C. It's pretty harmless if you take it. Some vitamins you don't want to take too much of. They're not water soluble. And they can cause problems. Um, contains only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. If one gram is burned in oxygen, we get 1.5 grams of CO2, 0 0.409 grams of water formed. Find its empirical and molecular formulas. Okay? So, we're going to do mass of CO2 to moles of CO2, moles of CO2 to moles of carbon, right? But we got to figure out this oxygen. So, what we do is we convert the carbon and hydrogen completely to mass, right? And then we know we started with this. If we know how much mass of carbon we got and how much mass of hydrogen we got, we know the remaining mass had to be oxygen because that's all that's in this compound. So this one's worked out like this because there's tons of, tons of stuff here. Okay, so this is my mass of carbon to moles of carbon. Mold, I'm sorry, mass of CO2 to moles of CO2, moles of CO2 to moles of carbon. Moles of carbon to mass of carbon because I need that to figure out the oxygen. Other words, you don't need this step. We didn't do this here, right? We stopped at moles right here. Sorry, I'll go back. <laughs> we stopped at moles here because we didn't need it. We didn't have any oxygen. Here we need that mass because we're going to have to subtract it from this to figure out the oxygen mass. And the oxygen is tricky because some's coming from the atmosphere. That's why we're doing this. And remember, this is a recorded video, so you don't have to kill yourself to write this all down. It's more important to understand what, what we're doing here. And that is mass of CO2 to moles of CO2, moles of CO2 to moles of carbon, and then moles of carbon to mass of carbon because we need that number, and you'll see why we need that number. We'll do the same thing now for hydrogen. Questions? <laughs> do it for hydrogen. Is everybody good? Can I go on to the next slide? Or? Do the same thing for hydrogen. Mass of water to moles of water. Don't forget that there's two hydrogen for every one water. Unlike carbon, there's one carbon for every one CO2. There's two hydrogen, so that's the one difference. Otherwise, everything else is the same. In terms of the steps, the numbers are different, obviously. The last step is to convert moles of carb hydrogen to, to grams of hydrogen. That's just the molar mass of hydrogen. These are all just the last step is all just the molar masses. That's hydrogen. 
That's carbon. Now we have the grams of carbon and the grams of hydrogen. And we know those only came from the compound, OK? Because we got a combustion chamber, we can pump in pure, if we're concerned, if this is really serious analytical. We don't want any sort of carbon and hydrogen from the outside trace amounts. We can have a chamber where we pump in pure oxygen. And then we know we have a, a evacuated chamber that we're going to fill with oxygen. We know there's absolutely no way there's any hydrogen or carbon in there. So this carbon and hydrogen had to come from our original vitamin C sample. So now we can take those masses and simply subtract them from that one gram, right? Because the vitamin C only contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The rest has to be oxygen. So let's subtract that out. The mass of the sample minus the mass of carbon plus the mass of hydrogen will give us the mass of oxygen. And then we can do the same thing with the oxygen to go mass to moles and, and all that. So we got 0.544 grams of oxygen. But we don't need to do it. We just got to, so I'll have to go back one step in a sense, because remember what we're really after to get the molar ratio is the moles of carbon and the moles of hydrogen. So we'll kind of have to, we kind of, you know, would have stopped here normally, right? We don't have that number now, so we've got to kind of calculate it. And we don't have this number here if we would have stopped here. We get moles of all of them, and then we can do divide by smallest, multiply to a whole. So there it is. That was the grams of carbon that we figured out on the first slide. That's the grams of hydrogen we figured out in the second slide, and that's the grams of oxygen we just did on the previous slide by subtraction, all divided by their molar masses to get our moles. We kind of did the same thing, percent to mass, mass, well, we didn't have percent. We just did mass, so we didn't have the percent part. So just mass to moles, right? We had to do some additional steps there, but divide by smallest, multiply to whole will still be the final steps. Questions? How do we go? So is there, so, because there's C, H, and O in vitamin C, right? Right. For some reason, I thought we were talking about the amount of No. Yeah, so we're trying to, we're trying to figure out how much oxygen came originally from the sample because some came from the air. Okay, yes. And this is the only way to, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. All right, anything else? So now we can just divide by smallest, multiply to a whole. And you get one, one and a third, and one. 1.333 is a third, so that's close enough. Once again, if you get weird numbers, you did math wrong. Stop. If you get one point, you know, four, there's a problem. You get 1.7, 1 1.6, there's a problem. 1.9, if it's 1.999, that's fine. 1.95, that's fine. You start getting like 1.90, 1.91, you might want to double check your math. They should be really close. Like, I'd say, you know, two significant figures close to the whole number. So 1.95 is 2.0 to two significant figures. Yeah, 1.91, uh, that's 1.9. Okay, divide by smallest, multiply it to whole. We can just multiply by three, right? Because that's one and a third. Three, four, three. That is our empirical formula for vitamin C through combustion analysis. Again, too long for an exam, so that would have to be 
screen down, maybe do one without oxygen or give you some information somehow. Look at how I've done it in the past. Questions? Houston. Oh, maybe we still have to do that. Yes, we did. Thank you. I forgot that we were also given, thank you. We were given the molar mass of vitamin C. So the, the question originally said, what's, yeah, there it is right there. Empirical and molecular formula. Thank you, Houston. So we're not done. So we got the empirical formula, three times 12. I did a shorthand notation here. Because usually you can, you don't need, it's going to be a whole number multiple and you'll be able to see it. So just be three times 12 plus four plus three times 16, 88. 88 times two, 176, there you are. So you don't have to worry about sick bigs when you do that, just take hold, you know. No question, are you just thinking? <laughs> it's just the molar mass is really to take into only two sick bigs. Or, Multiply all those by two, you wind up with C6H8O6. Doesn't tell you anything about the arrangement of the atoms, but at least you have the molecular formula. Okay, any other questions? That's the chapter.